us today from Utah's Hogle Zoo. My name's Suzanne and I'm a member of our education department and today I'm here to talk to you about adaptations. We're gonna have a lot of fun looking at a lot of really cool stuff and I'm gonna need your help. You're gonna need a pencil and a piece of paper to write on to join me in doing this activity. So in a second, I want you to hit pause, go find a pencil and a piece of paper and when you're ready, come back and hit start and we'll get going. talk about adaptations today. Have you heard the word adaptation before? Maybe you have and maybe you haven't. But what an adaptation is, is something that helps an animal to survive. It could be a body part or it could be a behavior, something they have or something they do that helps them live where they live and do what they do. And it's really important for the adaptation to fit their environment or their habitat where they live. Let's look at sharks for a second. Think about a shark. It has fins for swimming in the water, it has gills for breathing, and it does really well in its ocean habitat. But what if we took a shark and put it on top of a mountain? Would it be able to live there? No, it would die, right? Because swim fins and gills for breathing in the water are not going to help very much on top of a mountain. So it needs to have adaptations that match its environment. And if they go together, then the animal will be able to survive where it lives. So today we're going to talk about adaptations in animals and every single animal in the whole world has adaptations. Every kind of animal has multiple adaptations. We could be here for the rest of time talking about adaptations, but I know you have other stuff to do. So we're going to talk about three main kinds of adaptations today. And my number one kind of adaptation we're going to talk about is hair. Have you ever thought about hair before and how it could help an animal to survive? What I want you to do really quick is in a second I'm going to tell you to hit pause and while you're paused I want you to take two minutes and write down all the different ways you can think of that hair might help an animal to survive. Are you ready? Take two minutes and write down as many as you can think of. Go! <music> ways did you think of that a hair might help an animal survive? More than two? More than four? More than seven? Here are some that I thought of and if they're on your paper put a check mark next to them and we'll see if you thought of all the same ones that I thought of. The first way that hair could help an animal survive is to keep it warm. Here is some hair from a snow leopard. Snow leopards live in the Himalaya. They're cats that live at very high elevation that means way up high in the mountains. And if you've ever been way up high in the mountains, or even if you just look out the window right now at the mountains, you might see there's lots of rocks and snow. And it gets very cold up there. So they need to have really thick, long fur that helps keep them warm. So the hair on a snow leopard helps keep it warm. That's a great adaptation for living where they live. Oh, what's another way hair could help keep an animal alive? Well, how about camouflage? Did you say camouflage? Camouflage is blending in with your surroundings. So when you look at the hair of a polar bear, you can see that it's perfect for blending in with the ice and snow in the polar bear's habitat. Their nice white fur helps blend in and helps them to hide from animals they might be trying to hunt and eat. But did you know a polar bear's hair is not white? It's true. If you look at polar bear hair, it's not white at all. In fact, I have a handy model here. This is my handy scientific model of polar bear hair. Polar bear hair is made up of individual strands that are hollow and clear, just like this straw. And when I have just one straw by itself, it looks pretty clear. But when I have a whole bunch of straws together, they look white. And polar bear hair works the same way. So when you have a whole lot of polar bear hairs, they look white, but they're actually clear and hollow. So the sunshine can shine right through them onto their skin. And it warms them up in the cold Arctic air. And in fact, their skin is very special too. The skin on a polar bear, let's see if we can find a spot here. Can you see through the thinner hair right here? Their skin is actually dark. Now what's gonna get warm faster in the sun? Something that's dark or something that's white? Something that's dark, right? Well, the polar bear doesn't wanna be a black bear because then it couldn't hide in the snow, but it has black skin that, that can get warm in the sun as the sun shines through its clear hairs. But the clear hairs all look white and so the polar bear can be dark and white at the same time and stay warm. So they have very special hair that helps them to stay warm. 
What a great adaptation for living in the snow. I wish I had hair like that. Hmm, what's another one we could talk about? Some hair is very special. This hair is from a zebra. And you may think, how is that special? It's striped. But the zebra's hair is actually really short. It's warm in Africa, so they don't need thick, long fur to keep them warm. But their hair protects their skin. What might it need to be protected from in Africa? The sun? Definitely needs to be protected from the sun. In Africa, the sun can be very strong, especially right on the equator. And zebras can't wear a hat or sunscreen like you and I. So their hair isn't too long, so they don't get too hot, but it covers up their skin and helps to protect them from sunburns. After all, where do you get more sunburns? Here or here? Right here, right? The hair is not as thick. So that's why we wear sunscreen. So their hair protects them from the sun. It can also protect them from other things. What do you think they might have a lot of on the plains in Africa? Something that's really annoying. Something you might have to deal with in summertime, especially in the evening. How about bugs? Well, animals have hair to protect from bugs too. This is a tail of a giraffe. And it has camouflage spots and it has hair to protect it from the sun, but at the end of its tail, it has very special long thick hair that acts like a fly swatter. And they can keep all those bugs off of them so they don't have itchy bug bites all the time. My hair is not stiff and strong enough to do that even when I have a ponytail. Another cool way that hair can help an animal survive is by being waterproof. This is hair from a beaver. Beaver fur has a long outer coat of these nice shiny hairs that the beaver combs and combs and combs and puts oil on from a gland near its tail and they can make all of these outer shiny hairs waterproof to keep the water away from the beaver's skin. But underneath, they have short, curly, little fluffy hairs that trap lots and lots and lots of little tiny air bubbles next to the beaver's skin. This makes a puffy coat of air in between the water and the beaver and helps keep the water away from the beaver's skin and keeps the beaver warm. In the water, it can be very cold. Have you ever gone swimming in a lake or a pond or stuck your toes in a creek? The water can be really cold. So this special hair helps keep the beaver warm when he's swimming in the water. Hmm, how about these hairs? Have you seen hairs like this before? What animal do you think they're from? Did you say porcupine? You're right. These hairs are for defense. They may not look like your hairs and mine, but they grow the same way out of the porcupine's skin. But they get very hard and very pointy when they're exposed to the air. They get very stiff. And so they are a good protection from predators. Would you want to eat something really stabby like this? No way. The lion doesn't want to either. So these hairs are for protection. And then last, Another way that an adaptation for hair can help an animal survive is it can help you look good, right? Raise your hand if you did your hair today. Okay, I did. Your hair can help you look good and it helps animals look good too. This is the mane of a lion. Oh, in lions, who has a mane? A girl or a boy lion? The boys, right? That's an easy way to tell them apart. Well, the boys have this big, thick mane that shows everybody else that they're a big, tough boy. And when they get older, the mane turns black, so all the other lions can see that he's a big, tough boy. The other boys know not to bother him, and all the girls know that he's a big, tough boy, and they like that. So his hair helps him to look good. These are all different ways that hair is an adaptation that helps these animals survive. Now we're going to take a second and look at a live animal with some really cool hair. This is a Lesser Madagascar Hedgehog Tenrec. He has a name much bigger than him, but basically it means he's a small animal that eats insects and lives in Madagascar, and he has very cool hair. Look at all of these little hairs all over his body. They're stiff like the porcupine quills. He looks like a little hairbrush with legs. He is just the right size for a lot of different animals to snack on, so his sharp hairs help protect him from predators. He can curl up in a ball with just spikes on the outside, and he can stay curled up like that until the predator decides to leave him alone. And then he goes back about his business looking for bugs and worms and other good things to eat. So his hair is an adaptation that protects him from predators. Wasn't that Tenrec neat? He's one of my favorite animals. 
So, I want you to look back at that list you made of all the different types of hair adaptations you could think of in two minutes. How many of those did I talk about? Did you have ones that I didn't think of? That's great. Did I have ones that you didn't have to think of? Go ahead and add them to your list. And then hit pause, and I want you to write down one animal example for each one of those adaptations. And then when you're done, hit play again, and we'll move on to talking about something else. All right, let's talk about something besides hair for a while, okay? How about teeth? Have you ever really thought about teeth before? Obviously, they help an animal eat, but are all teeth the same? Let's try a little experiment really quickly. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to imagine that you're holding in your hand the roundest, most beautiful, shiniest apple you've ever seen. Maybe it's yellow, maybe it's red, maybe it's green, maybe it's covered in caramel, I don't know, but it's the nicest looking apple you've ever seen. Now imagine taking a great big bite of that apple. Freeze. Which teeth were you going to use to take that bite? Your back teeth? Your front teeth, right? Your front teeth are called incisors. They're nice and flat and they fit together like this when you take a bite, so they're good at biting off pieces of things. So your incisors are really good for biting. Now imagine chewing a bite of your giant apple. Are you going to use your incisors for that? I don't think that would work very well. I would probably need a bib and it would probably take me all day to eat an apple if I was chewing with my incisors. No, we like to chew with our molars, right, in the back. Molars are big and broad and flat with some bumps on the top, so they're really good for grinding things up and chewing. This is an example of an elephant molar. Elephants use these to chew all the trees and leaves and plants that they eat. So you can see it's pretty wide and long and it's got bumps on the top for grinding up their food. So that's a molar. They're adapted for chewing. Now, every animal with teeth has teeth that are adapted for doing different jobs, just like you have incisors and molars to help you bite and to chew. They have teeth that are adapted for their jobs too. And by looking at the skull of an animal, we can learn a lot about it, including what it liked to eat. So let's look at these skulls here. Let's start with this one. Now, let's look at his teeth in the front here. They have lots of incisors, nice long flat teeth, really good for biting. Then they've kind of got a big gap. And then in the back, they've got lots of molars that are good for chewing up their food. Now, molars are really, really good for chewing. What kind of foods do you think take a lot of chewing? Plants, right? This animal was an herbivore. Herbivore means it eats plants. And this is the skull of a zebra. So the zebra has incisors in the front that are good for biting off grass and lots of molars in the back that are good for all the chewing that it takes to chew up lots of grass. So he has teeth that are adapted for what he needs to eat and where he needs to eat. He lives on the plains of Africa where there's lots and lots of grass. So this zebra has adaptations to help him eat grass. Now let's look at another skull. Ooh, this guy looks very different. Now, in the front, he's got lots of small incisors. They're smaller than the zebras, but they do the same job with biting and nibbling. And then, whoa! What's next to that? Those are big, sharp teeth. Do you have big, sharp teeth like that? No, I don't. <laughs> but these are called canines. What kind of job do you think that canines are adapted for doing? Did you say grabbing or killing? You're right. They can grab. They're really long, so they can sink in deep. And they're really pointy, so they can go in really easily and they help this animal hang on to its food. They can grab it and hang on with really strong jaw muscles. Now let's look in the back. Do these look like nice flat molars? They're a lot pointier than the ones on the zebra. These aren't actually molars at all. They're a third kind of teeth called carnassial teeth. Carnassial means they eat meat. These are meat teeth. Just like a carne asada burrito is full of meat, Carnassial teeth mean it's a carnivore. Carne means meat. So carnassial teeth work just like scissors. They're good at biting off a chunk of meat, which the animal then can swallow. 
This is the skull of a lion. And so it has teeth adapted for grabbing and killing, cutting off pieces of meat, or maybe even biting and nibbling and pulling the hair or the fur or the feathers off the animal that it caught. So it has teeth for a very specific job to help it eat meat in Africa. Have you ever looked at a cat when it's eating? They don't really chew, huh? Next time you feed your cat or see a cat on TV eating, you'll notice they might take a bite, but then they just gulp it down. They don't do a lot of chow chewing, chewing like a cow or like you or me. They just take a bite and gulp it down because that's what their teeth are adapted to do. Now, we've got an herbivore and we've got a carnivore. Let's look at this third skull here because he's a little more tricky. What on earth do you think this animal ate? Well, let's start in the front. He's got lots of incisors, good for biting and nibbling. And then he's got big canines. And what were they for? For grabbing, killing. But then in the back, he's got flat molars again, just like the zebra. What do you think this animal ate? Did you say meat and plants? You're right, he's an omnivore. Omnivore is a cool word that just means everything eater because this is a grizzly bear skull and they eat everything. They can grab fish and animals with their teeth. They can grab berries off the bush with their incisors. And then in the back, they have lots of flat molars for eating grass and berries and all the other foods that they like to eat. So this bear is adapted for eating all kinds of different things because he lives in a place that has all kinds of different food and he needs to be able to eat everything. I'd like you to take a second with your paper and pencil. And in a moment, we're gonna put a shot more close up of the bear on your screen. And I want you to draw a picture of the bear skull and label his different kinds of teeth. The incisors, the canines, and the molars. Go. Okay, how did your drawing work out? I know not all of us are artists, but it's important to try. So we've talked about different types of teeth and different animals, but there are a lot of animals that don't have any teeth at all, like birds. Birds don't have teeth. Teeth are very heavy and very dense. Think about how a robin could fly if it had 32 really heavy teeth in its mouth. Probably wouldn't work, it'd probably crash a lot. So they have other adaptations that help them to eat their food. What does a bird have instead of teeth? A beak, right? We're going to look at a really cool bird right now that has a very cool beak. The kookaburra is a bird from Australia. Look at his long straight beak. His beak works just like a pair of chopsticks. He can sit on a branch and watch for something delicious like a mouse or a lizard or a snake to walk by and then he swoops down and grabs them in his chopsticks beak. Then he can fly back up on the branch, maybe give it a little whack and gulp it right down so he can swallow his food whole. But other birds might have a hooked beak for tearing or a flat beak for sifting through the mud or any number of other shapes that help them to survive. There's all kinds of really cool beak adaptations. The next time you're outside watching birds, notice all of the different types of beak adaptations that you could find on birds around town. That kookaburra was so cool, wasn't he? His beak is adapted for grabbing and hanging onto things, just like his feet were hanging onto my hand. Did you notice how nicely he sat on my hand? His feet are adapted for sitting on a perch like that. But a lot of different feet are adapted for a lot of different things. So that's our third type of adaptation we're gonna talk about today, feet. I want you to take a moment with your piece of paper and your pencil, hit pause, and write down all the different things that feet can do in one minute. Are you ready? Go. All right, how many things did you think of? I bet you thought of a lot, because feet are really helpful for doing a lot of different things. Here are some examples of different animal feet. Let's look at what these feet are good at doing. This one right here, these are the bones of an ostrich foot. Ostrich feet are really good at running. Look at him, he's only got two toes. 
One is for running really fast, and the other one's for keeping his balance. An ostrich doesn't have big sharp claws that are super pointy for tearing. But they're more like the cleats on the bottom of your soccer shoes. They help him to go really fast without slipping and falling on his face, just like your soccer shoes help you to go fast without falling down. So the ostrich is adapted for running and for walking because he's too heavy to fly. So that's one type of foot adaptation. How about this bird's foot? What do you think this foot is for? Grabbing. This is an eagle's foot, and he has big, sharp claws that are good for grabbing, just like the teeth on the lion's skull. They can sink in deep, they can hold on really tight with his strong leg muscles, and he can pick up something like a small animal or a big fish and fly back to his nest. So an eagle's feet are adapted for grabbing. How about this guy? This is a grizzly bear foot, and he has a big foot for walking around with his big heavy body, and then these long, long claws that are really good for digging. Bears like to dig up tubers and roots and things like that to eat, or rip open a bee nest to get to the honey and the bugs inside, or even to dig a den to sleep in for the winter. So his feet are adapted for digging. This foot is the footprint of a tiger an Amur tiger or a Siberian tiger. They live where it's very cold in the snow, and so he'll have hair between his toes to keep them warm, but this foot is especially well adapted for sneaking. Have you ever heard a cat walk across your kitchen floor? What did it sound like? Nothing? That's because the cat has soft pads on the bottom of his feet that make it possible for him to walk very, very quietly. He can even pull his claws up inside so you can't see his claws here on the footprint. That keeps the claws really, really sharp so they don't wear down on the ground, but even quieter. Do you ever hear a dog walk across your kitchen floor? What does it sound like? Click, 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 right? The dog's claws are out clicking on the floor, so you can hear the dog walking around much more than you can hear the cat because the cat's feet are adapted for sneaking. This foot is the foot of an ibis. An ibis is a bird that wades in the water. Wading birds have really long legs so that their bodies can stay dry while they're wading in the water and looking for food. But he has long toes to spread out so he doesn't sink down into the mud and get stuck. So when I walk in the mud, my big feet kind of get stuck and maybe my shoe will get sucked off. It's not very easy for me to walk in the mud. But the long skinny toes of the ibis help keep him from sinking in too deep. So that's a foot adapted for wading. How about this foot? Whose foot does that look like? Did you say a duck? You're right. A duck foot is adapted for swimming. Do you ever see ducks go by on a, on a pond? Does it look like they're doing very much work at all? They're just moving. It looks like they're not doing anything. That's because below the surface, their feet are pushing the water with their webbed feet. This webbing between their toes helps them push a lot more water than our hands could do because we don't have webbing in between our fingers. So they can do very little work and still swim really well, whereas we would be doing a lot of work to go as fast as a duck. Their feet are adapted for swimming. And this last cool foot is very cool. This foot is adapted for climbing. This is a gorilla's foot. See how big it is? He's got big toes, and his biggest toe is it actually adapted to be a lot like a thumb. Could you climb a tree a lot better if you had thumbs on your feet? I bet you could climb as good as a gorilla. His big, tough toes help him grasp the branches as he's climbing around. And his foot works just like a hand. Have you ever thought about your hands before? Hands are really just really fancy feet. And they have adaptations that make them really cool. They have thumbs. Our thumbs are called opposable because we can make them opposite of the rest of our fingers, which makes it easy to grab things, hang on tight, and do stuff like climbing or maybe zipping a zipper. I want you to take a second and try writing your name on your paper. Pretty easy, right? Now try writing your name without using your thumbs. You might have to hold your pencil differently. It might be really tricky. Maybe try drawing a flower without using your thumbs. Does it work as well as it normally does? It's a lot harder, huh? Because you're not using that adaptation that is built for doing lots of cool things. So as you go throughout the rest of your day, I want you to think about all the adaptations that animals have and that you have. 
Think about how you use your thumbs while you eat an apple or brush your teeth or tie your shoes. Think about all the different kinds of feet and teeth and hair that animals have to help them to survive. So the next time you look at an animal, whether it's in your backyard, on TV or in a video, or even here at the zoo, think about the different types of adaptations that animal has to help it survive and all the different kinds of animals we have here in the world. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you've had a lot of fun and I hope to see you again soon at Utah's Hogle Zoo.